Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. We're in the, we're in the midst of a series of sermons from the book of Leviticus, and our intent is to show how it is a book that was, because uh, a lot of people just don't want to mess with it, how it's almost essential to understand at least parts of it, to have an appreciation for what the uh, New Testament has to say uh, about the life of Christ and how the Messiah was the fulfillment of everything they were looking forward to and that Messiah was none other than Jesus. And then we're going to look at the end just a little bit of how this is going to ac actually let us know a little bit what's going to happen when the kingdom finally comes and Jesus returns and brings heaven back to earth. Thinking about heaven reminds me that many years ago, probably one of the most popular preachers in the country uh, was a guy from that was born in Scotland, and he ultimately became a preacher in a large Presbyterian church in Washington, D.C., and then later became chaplain of the Senate. He was preaching one Sunday morning and he did something that very few Presbyterian preachers would ever do. He laid aside his script for the message and said, I just want to talk a little bit about heaven. His name was Peter Marshall. They actually wrote a, Catherine, his wife, wrote a book about him, a man called Peter. And then there was a movie made, a Christian movie made about him as well. He was extremely well liked and very popular. Presbyterian preachers usually are uh, well-educated, as he was, and usually well-prepared when they go to the pulpit. Sometimes they're drier and dirt because they read it rather than preach it, uh, but uh, they're usually extremely well-prepared. And while he was preaching about heaven, he suddenly grabbed his chest and fell forward onto the pulpit and had to have help. He was in the process of dying of a heart attack. I think that in some instances, godly men and women do have premonitions of death. Given a little bit of a warning, why he laid aside that sermon and preached on heaven before he had that heart attack, we'll never know until we get to meet him and ask him. But I was shocked because I had never taken the time to research to the extent that I have today about how God has told us how much, there's a lot that we can learn about what lies beyond death. Actually, there are several places. There's an Old Testament passage that is quoted in the New Testament in the book of Corinthians where the Apostle Paul quotes that you know, I hadn't seen, ear hadn't heard, neither had it entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for us. But then if you keep on reading in that same passage in Corinthians, he says, but in this day and age, the Holy Spirit has revealed to us some of those things. And so we do know a lot more. And, and, a, and a few years ago, a fellow by the name of Randy Alcorn wrote a book just on heaven and they actually wrote another one for children. You can buy those things for about 14 bucks, and it's a pretty good-sized book. A lot of it is speculation, but a lot of it is uh, factual information taken from Scripture, and I enjoyed kind of going back through it again. So we're in the, in the midst of how does God prepare us to understand these things? I can tell you that without the book of Leviticus, we wouldn't. And what he's, God has done is that any time that he has done something spectacular, he really doesn't want you to forget it. And so what he did was to say, okay, because of what I have done here, we're going to remember it by having a feast day. Feast day is the same as me, where we get our English words festive or a festival. 
so that we won't forget it. We do that with national holidays. All countries do. We have our Thanksgiving time and we have our 4th of July. We have those days that we celebrate. But that whole concept actually came from the Old Testament and is spelled out in specifically in the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus. If you were to look at the 23rd chapter of the, of the book of, of Leviticus, you would see how God lays this out. The first thing that you would look at in that, in that uh, 23rd chapter, if you go down to uh, about verse 3, the first thing that God didn't want you to forget, never ever forget, was who created all of this stuff. Where did it come from? And believe it or not, that's what the Sabbath day was for. The celebration of the Sabbath wasn't so you could have a day off, even though that was important. The Sabbath day was really to, so that you would never forget that God created heaven and earth, and he completed it in six days. In the seventh day, all he really had to do was kind of look over what he had done and say, I did good because he really did pronounce that it was good and, and, and he blessed it. And so what he's saying is, I want you to take a day off once a week and ponder who I am and what I've done because you wouldn't be here and all of this stuff we call earth and all that's around it wouldn't be here. He wrote it this way. He said, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. And the first one of those was the Sabbath, which is literally in Hebrew means seventh. The Sabbath day begins for the Orthodox Jew on at sundown or usually six o'clock on Friday evening and ends at sundown on Saturday evening from Friday evening to Saturday evening it's considered a day of rest and if you were to visit the Orthodox family sometime and the Orthodox are the ones who wear the little black hats and have the little curls alongside their head you see them on TV there there's a You'll see them occasionally in Cincinnati because there's actually there's three different sects of, of Judaism, just like there was in Jesus' day. You had your Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes who were the primary ones. But today you have the, the Orthodox Jew, and these are the ones who wear the black and the curly. Then you have a couple others, and, and the uh, synagogue that we had here for many, many years uh, was a liberal Jewish, and they got their their uh, students out of a seminary in Cincinnati. They actually have a pretty good seminary f for developing um, the, the, their preachers and teachers. He says, then on six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a, is a Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. You're not to do any work. Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. So that's the first thing he did. He said, I want you never to forget who created heaven and earth because that is God. Now, we live in a day when that's being questioned. But when you ask them, then where did it come from? They say, well, it probably span off, uh, was spun off from another. Well, where did it come from? You get to what's referred to as in, in the discussions as infinite regressions because sooner or later you, there has to be an, what, what the Greeks call the unmoved mover that started the whole thing. You're better off just to read what Genesis chapters 1, 2, 3 said and believe it, you'd be better off. But the first thing he said, I don't want you ever to forget it who I am and where it came from, and that's what the Sabbath day was for more than anything else. Now, we have a tendency to think that these festivities were, were just, oh boy, I don't have to go to work today. 
but they were sacred and solid assemblies where the people had to be where to be reminded. We have reminders for our celebrated days. You sit, you can sit out the window where I live and watch the fireworks. It's for free. See it pretty good. And so we have things that we do. We're, we're facing a turkey day, and yes, we are going to have a turkey dinner here, a Thanksgiving dinner. I asked David, and he said, yeah, we can do that. So we'll be giving you more information about that in time. But the significant acts of God, and we're just going to look at one or two of them, because there were only three, only three feasts that they were required to, to uh, pay attention to. And if you go back in the book of, uh, of Exodus and start at, uh, in chapter 23 down at verse... 14, it says, three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the same as Passover. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, just as I commanded you. Do this at an appointed time in the month of Abib, for in that month you came out of Egypt. And so what is he saying? The Passover was a significant act when you were delivered from slavery by God. You couldn't have gotten out of there if I hadn't seen fit to see that you got out. I had to, I had to deal with Pharaoh, and I had to get him to the place where he was saying, get this bunch out of here. And I don't want you to ever forget that the only way you got out of slavery into freedom was by my activity, not yours. And I don't want you ever to forget it. And so once a year, I want you during Passover time to eat unleavened bread. In verse 15, he goes to the second feast. He says, celebrate the feast of harvest for the first fruits of the crop you sow in your field. The third one is celebrate the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops for the field. Three times a year all the men are to appear before the sovereign God. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. So he spells out when they're to do what and how they're to do it. Well, so he says you're to have a festival once a year to celebrate me getting you out of Egypt. That was God acting. You only respond. And you, if you want to be able to listen and find out what is legitimate biblical doctrine and what, if, what isn't, always do this. Man never acts and God reacts. That's false doctrine. God acts and we react. That's the truth. And what we do then is dependent upon him in totality. So he had, the, he had, first of all, the Passover, or, or rather the, the creation. Then we get to the Passover. The creation was never to be forgotten, forgotten because once a week we have the Sabbath. And then there was another interesting time that you probably didn't pay much attention to. But if you look in the book of Joshua, you find an interesting event there of something that was to be a memorial that would be visible that they would never, that never forget. You see, they not only were delivered out of captivity, but then they had to find, God had to find a way to get them under the leadership of Joshua into the promised land and take control of it. And when you look in the fourth chapter of the book of Joshua, you will see that he said, and I know, and, and God said, you, you can't take this on your own. I'm going to have to do it for you. You remember? That's the reason he said, you walk around Jericho. And he'd already said, I'm going to have most of the people scared off anyway. And if you do what I tell you, it'll just fall into your hands. And so what he was telling them, you remember, if you want to win, you look to me. If you want to lose, go on your own. Because sooner or later you're going to be a loser. But I want you never to forget who gave this land to you and how you got it. 
And so when you read the fourth chapter of the book of Joshua, he actually tells us that. He says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down in a place where you stay tonight. So what he was saying here, and by the way, this is a miracle of timing. And you will find out a lot of the miracles had to do with timing. Not as, because what probably happened here, and we really don't know, because the scripture doesn't tell us. But many times during the year, years ago, when the Jordan was free to run freely and didn't have all of the dams and stuff that it has now, actually it runs into the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea has been dropping, 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 dropping. It'll be dry one of these days at the rate it's going because they stop all the water coming down and use it for irrigation. So what probably happened after the rainy season is that there was a mudslide, because this happened periodically anyway. And it would dam up the Jordan River from running freely for a while. So that wasn't that unusual. What was unusual was this. God said, you go down and you have the priest to stick your toe in the water, and it will start receding. See, it was a matter of timing, not what happened, but it was a matter of timing. And God dammed up the river so they could go across it. And he said, when you're out in the middle where the priests stand with the Ark of the Covenant, pick up stones. Now, this was not what we have in our culture today where we go pay somebody to get to lift weights. There's a better way of doing it. You live to be 82 doing it this way, and it doesn't cost you anything. But you know, people are funny. Now, that's supposed to be humorous. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. You had an extra night's sleep. Get with it. You had an hour to extra sleep. But anyway, so they took these stones, and he said, Now, where you stop tonight, on the, and, and that plains of Jericho is a, is a large uh, plain where the water used to overflow, and, and it's, the Jordan is a, is a beautiful, uh, Jericho is a beautiful place. And so... They piled these 12 big rocks up here. What for? Well, the one thing they have plenty of in Israel are rocks. So he goes ahead and, and read, and so we'll go ahead and he tells us what it's for. So Joshua called together the 12 men who had been appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the, uh, of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites. And it's to serve as a sign among you in the future. And when your children ask you, what, are these, what do these stones piled up here mean? Tell them how the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it, when the, when it crossed the Jordan and the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones, listen to this, are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. That's 10 cents to our northern Kentucky way of saying, I don't want you ever to forget. I want you to remember. And every time you see this pile of rocks, be sure and tell your children, this is what God had done in the past. So you see, these feasts, these festivals, were to be a memorial of some great thing that God had done. And that whole 23rd chapter is all about that. And, and, um, and he spells out in uh, uh, the 23rd chapter of, of your wonderful book of Leviticus is all about that. And when you look, you know, and he actually spells out to him and says, I just don't want you birds ever to forget what this is all about. So these memorial feasts, Start here in the Old Testament so that when we get to some New Testament things, it will make sense to us why he said what he said. And so there are these, um, these festivals. In verse 21 of chapter 23, he says concerning those festivals, this is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. I don't want you ever forget. Then there was one other that we need to make reference to. 
and then we'll move into the New Testament. They move after the Passover, they moved to the foot of what we often refer to as Mount Sinai. You should never forget that the peak that they went up, while they, while, that Moses went up with Aaron while they were there, was called Mount Horeb, H-O-R-E-B. That's the peak. Uh, and that was what they called the sacred mountain because it is there that God took this bunch of slaves and turned them into a nation. It was there that he gave the law. He gave them a constitution and bill of rights. And when they got their constitution and bill of rights, they ceased to be a traveling bunch of ex-slaves. They became a nation of Israel. You and I should have an appreciation for that because nearly this whole country came from Western New York and, and came over here and we fussed around with the English in particular and sometimes the French and sometimes the Spanish. But it was only when we got our own Constitution and Bill of Rights that we became Americans. And lest we forget, on the 4th of July, we all party. That's what a festival is. And most of you would enjoy your festival more if uh, the preachers were invited. You're not as sleepy as I thought you were. Okay. Now, let's go to the New Testament era and what happened here because, you know, he, God said, I don't want you ever forget, I don't want you ever forget it. These things that I've just mentioned. There were others, but these are the ones that he said of, of, of paramount importance. Now, let's look in the New Testament era because, as I said, in, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 2.9, he quotes from the Old Testament about uh, what God has in store. To read it exactly, it says this. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, but you need to keep on going. But God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit teaches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? It's in the same way no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God who reveals it to us. And so we know a little bit about what God has in store for us because the Holy Spirit gave it to the Apostle Paul, who in turn gave it to us. And I was shocked, really, how much we know is going to take place when Jesus comes again. Now, the New Testament says these are the great events which we should never forget, and then we'll see how we're to remember it. Jesus, you remember, came into the world. Now, we've got this Old Testament concept. When you go over into the book of Galatians, the fourth chapter, he spells out very clearly that this is the act of God. The fourth chapter of the book of Galatians, he says, What I'm saying is this, as long as the heir is a child... He's no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, now who is our father and what is the time he has set? He answers that. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery, talking about children of Israel in slavery, under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. So what he was saying was, when God had all of his ducks in a row, that's how we say it where I came from in Bracken County, when God had all of his ducks in a row, he did what only he could do in sending his son into the world, but we wouldn't understand that either if it hadn't been what he had done that's recorded in Leviticus. So what happened in Leviticus? Leviticus, you brought your, you brought your offering to the Lord, 
by presenting it to the priest at the tabernacle. And by the way, there's something about that tabernacle you need to, you need to know that I bet you 99% of you don't know unless you were here last night. Did you know that that tabernacle, the dimensions that were so specific that God gave Moses and Aaron on Mount Sinai were exact duplications of the same thing that was in heaven? You know they got a tabernacle in heaven? They do. And the drawings were given to Moses to give to Aaron for them to make their time. And later on, those same dimensions were used when Solomon built the temple. And later on, when it was torn down and rebuilt by Herod, same dimensions. It's in the 8th chapter, verses 5 and 6 of the book of Hebrews. He spelled it. He said, that's exactly what he told you. And I'll bet you, you hadn't seen it before. This business of, of studying the scriptures is really fun. You might find out some things. Here's what he said. They serve at the sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. That's verse 5. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. So we get, we get little bits and pieces here and there until after a while it starts. So the, you brought your offering to the Lord. Now, if you were real poor, it might be a pigeon or a dove. But you brought it, and then the priest was required by law to examine what you brought to see if it were flawed. And if it were flawed, it, were reject, it would be rejected. Now, this caused some corruption in the time of Jesus, if you remember. You remember when he went to the temple and turned all those tables over and chased people out with a hog whip? I mean, he flat lost it and chased them out of there. You don't see Jesus getting angry. But, and then he, and he yelled at them and said, You've turned a house of prayer into a den of thieves, a house of merchandise. The whole system had become corrupt because what they were doing is okay let's say I'm a poor guy and, and I bring a, a, a pigeon and he would check it all of the priests look it over he was a corrupt he was a crook he was greedy he was there to pat his pocketbook he'd say well I can't do that this feather's out of place and so he'd throw it in a pen and pull one out and say you're going to have to buy this one from us and they would charge exorbitant prices for them if it were a sheep or a goat, they were never approved. They were denied, and then they would take your sheep, put it in there, and when the next sucker came along, they would take the one they denied and sell it to him. It was, a, it was a con game, and Jesus couldn't stand it because they had turned what God had intended to be a blessing to the people so they could make their offering and go back home thinking, I've dealt with the sin problem. I can live another year without fear. So they checked it carefully. Now, you had to understand that. Then the priest would offer it up as a sacrifice to the Lord. And once it would been, and smoke goes up from the, the part of the body that was assigned to be burnt on the burnt offering, the smoke would go up and, and it would indicate the prayers of the people going up before the Lord asking for forgiveness and the God grants it. And so they could go back home then feeling that the load of sin had been lifted from their body and their mind. But the real important thing here is to remember that when Jesus went to the cross, before he got there, he spent several days being examined by even the people who didn't like him. They checked him out. Even the guy in the most powerful position there, Pontius Pilate, says, I, find, I can't find any fault with him. What was going on here? You see, he was being examined as a sacrifice going to the cross and was found to be without default, without any fault. He was without sin. 
And so when he goes to the cross, he has been examined by good, bad, and, and indifferent and found to be without flaw. Therefore, he could be offered as a perfect sacrifice and the shedding of his blood relieves sin for all of those who put their faith in him as the Son of God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And so that's what, that, but without understanding how the sacrificial system worked in the Old Testament, you would, in the book of Leviticus, you, and, and you would never understand what was going on with Jesus here when he was arrested and checked and checked and checked and checked and checked. And, and then when he was on the cross, God verbally gave his approval. The perfect sacrifice had been offered. You see, in Galatians 4, it said God sent his son into the world when the thing was just exactly right. And then that son died on the cross. Interesting thing about, I've mentioned it before, and I think probably I'm going to have to, and, and I'm going to have trouble getting through here today. So uh, you might pray that my watch works. Yeah, because see, you all didn't change this one up here, so I got another hour. I don't feel too burdened about it. But there is a... See, what Jesus did then, because in the Old Testament, nobody went straight to heaven. Nobody could go to heaven until Jesus died on the cross. Nobody. They went to Hades. And a part a section of Hades is called paradise. Same word that describes the Garden of Eden. So it, it would be helpful, I think, if you, in the 27th chapter of Matthew, there's some really interesting stuff here. Now listen to it carefully because this is the way it's recorded in Scripture. Jesus died on the cross, and it says, in verse, starting at verse 50, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Now, there's an interesting translation. If, if, if Scott were translating this and get it right, it would actually say, that he dismissed his spirit because he'd already made it very clear to everybody they couldn't take him unless he was willing to be there. He said, I could call legions of angels and take me out of here and, and wipe you suckers out. But because I promised my father I'm going to stay here and I'm going to die and I'm going to pay the price for your sin. So he... He didn't die a natural death. He dismissed his spirit. And that's a, and that's a fair way of, of, of treating the Greek term. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, indicating now any, everybody has access to God because the curtain separated the holy from the holy of holies. The earth shook and the rock split. Now listen with both ears. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus, and, but it was after Jesus' resurrection when he went into the holy city and appeared unto many people. What happened? When Jesus went to paradise, all of those Old Testament saints who had died were waiting on the perfect sacrifice to be offered. Jesus brought with him and took them into heaven with him when he went. Paradise is empty. You don't have to go to a garden. When you die, you go be with the Lord. Pretty good deal. So you need to remember that. You need to remember that. Now, so what do we have happen here? Then three days later, Jesus comes out of the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, so we have... Uh, a baby boy coming into the world who is God with skin on. We have him going to a cross and paying the perfect sacrifice. And then we have him being raised from the dead. And how in the heck are we going to remember that and not forget it? Because that's the gospel. Well, the early church did this all the time. You need to remember this. The early church would meet in people's homes. They didn't have fancy buildings, so they'd meet in somebody's home, usually at night because some of them were slaves. Many times there wasn't anybody there who could re hardly read and write. So what did they do? In most cases, they didn't have a preacher like we do today. Later on, they did. But they always did one thing. 
they always had communion. They always had communion. And this is referred to numerous times in the New Testament. We often quote, as Ralph did this morning from the book of Matthew, while you were taking the cup and the loaf. And you see, I, I personally could never go and participate in the life of a church over a period of time, a lengthy period of time that didn't have communion every Sunday. Now, a lot of churches don't. Some of them have it quarterly, some of it have it monthly, some of it have it once a year. And all of that was messed up during the Reformation. For you see, uh, the, the, there, were, there was a lot of anti-Catholic spirit during that time. And what they did is they quit having communion every week because the Catholics did and they didn't want to be like the Catholics and so they changed it. The Catholics had mass every weekend. And you know what? They were right. They were right. Most of the time when we react to something we don't like, we usually make a mistake. And, and we did. Intentions were right. Performance was wrong. Acts 2.42 says after Peter preached the first biblical uh, gospel sermon recorded in the second chapter of Acts, when he got, and it would kind of be neat if it happened here once in a while. It wouldn't want to happen too often. scare me probably. But when he finished preaching, somebody or a whole bunch of somebody's jumped up and said, now what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and, you know, and for the remission of sins, and you receive the or, and gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he said, well, okay, and after that, what do we do? And he said, you're to continue steadfastly or persistent in, or to continue to do, reading what the apostles write to you. Fellowship was what they were eating in their meals and sharing around the supper, because they usually had to carry in supper. Breaking of bread was the Lord's Supper at the end of that. And then to pray together. Later on, they appointed teachers who were called sometimes elders, sometimes different terms. Well, how are you going to remember that? Don't forget it. If you go to the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, you see, because in the 10th chapter, he talks about how the pagans continue to have their celebrations for the things that their so-called gods who are just man-made things did but he said Here, here's what you're to do the apostle Paul said for I received from the Lord what I pass, also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you this do in what remembrance of me it's a memorial And what is a memorial, except I don't want you to forget what God has done. What did God do? He sent his son into the world, died on the cross, raised from the dead, and it ain't over yet. He said, in the same way, after supper, I need to stop there. This is not the Lord's dinner. Some of you, so far, you, you sophisticated folks, you know, you, you're going to go out, tonight you'll go out for dinner. Well... I eat supper. Mother never did after we finished milking and had the coal in and the chicken hen house closed. She never did say, okay, boys, come on in for dinner. We had that at 12 o'clock. The horn blew on the old Model A, and we went home and ate dinner at lunchtime, like you sophisticated folks say. And while they were here in the evening, they had the Lord's Supper. Don't forget it. It's going to be biblical. So he says, in the same way, after supper, where they had had the Passover meal, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So what you were doing, you see, is when you ate the Lord's Supper, you preached the gospel and heard the gospel even though you didn't have a preacher. Because the gospel is the center of everything. I wish we could get everybody to get their arms around that. 
Well, let's move on here to the, wind this thing up a little bit here in the next hour and five minutes and see if we can get done. Now we're talking about Jesus coming again because that's a part of what he said. You keep on doing this memorable thing each Lord's Day, each first day of the week until he comes again. And the first day of the week for the Jew started 6 o'clock on Saturday night and ended on 6 o'clock in the evening on Sunday. It's the reason we feel comfortable, or at sundown, we feel comfortable with the Saturday evening service. Probably what took place in the 20th chapter of Acts was on a Saturday evening. Now, there's an interesting passage of Scripture that, that very few people pay much attention to. But Randy Alcorn was faithful in, in trying to stay biblical. A lot of stuff he said was in his book on heaven was, uh, he, he admitted to be his personal idea and some of it, he said could or could not be. But in the book of Isaiah, in the 25th chapter, there is a verse here that you don't want to ever forget. It's verse 6. And it is a prophecy. It is a prophecy of what's going to take place when Jesus comes again, brings heaven with him, and comes to earth. Here's what it says. On the mountain of the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine. That means the good stuff. The best of meats and the finest of wines. This was taken by the Old Testament scholars to believe that when God, when Jesus prayed, you know, your kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth, is when that kingdom comes, there's going to be eating and drinking. There's going to be feasting. Well, what are we going to celebrate? Because <clears throat> the... The sin problem is, is, is whipped and laid aside. And in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, it says that, that, that God is going to come to earth and this is where it's going to be. An eternal kingdom here on earth. Well, one of the things that, that some scholars fuss about, and I think they're just silly about it, is will there be eating and drinking in, the, in God's eternal kingdom? When we get our new body that's to live forever, will we have eating and drinking? And the answer is, uh-huh. Because you remember when Jesus was resurrected, he said to his disciples, I want you birds to meet me in Galilee. Well, they did what they would do normally. They were fishermen, and so they were up there fishing, and they were fixing some breakfast. And Jesus shows up with them in his resurrected body. Now, this is the body that appeared to them in the second chapter of Acts and with the door shut. So this is a resurrected body that isn't negatively affected by the environment of earth in its fallen condition. And he said to them, and Luke records it in the 24th chapter, verses 42 and 43, it ought to be on your outline, he says, give me a piece of fish. And he, he what are you fixing? We're fixing fish. My doctor, young young Dr. Phil Roberts is all the time trying to get me to eat veggies and fish. I said, at 82 years old, I'll eat whatever I please, you know. <laughs> but he's looking out for me, and he means well. But some of these young doctors need to know a little more about theology. And anyway. So here's what we know. We know that the resurrected body will eat and drink. And Jesus said... And we're going to have a shindig. I'm going to sponsor a shindig. My mother on her 90th birthday looked at the three of us boys and she said, when I'm 100, I want you all to have a shindig for me. I don't know what a shindig is, but it must be something. She didn't hardly make it. She just made it to 99, almost. So, what's going to happen? Let's see if I can explain it this way and it'll make sense to you. Through the years here at church, we've hit really had some neat festivities. I guess maybe the first one we had was of, of any significance was when Jim Irwin was here, Colonel Irwin, who had walked on the moon, and he came to share his faith with us. 
Later on, we had Ollie North in two or three different times to share us his faith. Pat Boone came and had a wonderful meeting with us. Didn't sing as good as he used to, but he did all right. And he shared his faith. He's an elder in a church in California. William's been to that church several times, church on the way. So now then, let's just think for a minute. Where Jesus has come back, heaven is on earth, the world has been cleansed by fire, and we're going to start, and the whole of earth is like the Garden of Eden. And he says, I want you to plan a party. And we will. We'll set up our tables, and we'll have a party. If it's Thanksgiving time, maybe we'll have turkey. I don't know. I prefer something from the river, but that's okay. And we'll have it all set up, and it comes time then for us to welcome the featured speaker. Are you ahead of me? Do you know who that's going to be? Jesus himself will be here and talk to us. Because the book of Revelation says with clarity that he will work and live among his people. And we won't have to ask when he shows up, who is he? His hands alone will show you. There's a lot about heaven that we can learn. And one of these days, if you keep coming, put money in the bucket, I'll tell you about it. Just kidding. Just, no, I'm not really. I, 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 no. But the time is up. And I think it's important for you to know that we wouldn't understand what that gathering would be like if he hadn't given us the old covenant and shown us how the feast thing, because you see, he started at creation when we first sinned, putting together the plan that would ultimately end up with us sharing our life with Jesus himself. That's the promise of Scripture. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And it sure is going to be kind of fun, I reckon, if it isn't scary, to have Jesus stand in our presence and share with us the insights of God himself. Those deep things that only he can really reveal to us that our eyes haven't seen and our ears haven't heard but oh, to be able to hear it from Jesus himself that lies before us. For all who love him, who repented of their sins, baptized believers who have given their life to Jesus Christ and received that Holy Spirit that guarantees us eternal life. We thank you, Father, for all you've done. And we celebrate that fact that you chose us and loved us paid the price for our sins and one of these days is coming to get us please lord jesus come quickly is my prayer in his name amen you're free to go christ community meets on saturday at 5 p.m and sunday at 10 30 a.m for more information visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our facebook page